Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to this uh, session, to this open lecture uh, on reconceptualizing peace studies as a research project, challenges and opportunities. Um, I will be presenting very briefly our distinguished guests today. Uh, I think the, the fact that we had to change rooms is illustrative of, of the uh, excellent speaker that we have here today, a reference in peace studies. Uh, I will very briefly introduce um, Johan Galtung and then give him the floor. Um, well, words cannot fully describe how privileged and honored I am personally, and we are all pers also uh, collectively, for hosting and presenting you to our dis distinguished guests today. Having myself been trained in doing research in the field of peace studies for some time now, as many of you in this room uh, also, we have been from the beginning introduced to the inescapable work of Johan Galtung, and he became one of the most fundamental references ever since. Introducing and presenting Johan Galtung in just a few minutes can be compared to some sort of mission impossible. I will try my best to make him and his extensive and outstanding work justice. Johan Galton is a professor of peace studies. He was born in 1930 in Oslo, Norway. He is a mathematician, sociologist, political scientist, and the founder of the discipline of peace studies. He founded the International Peace Research Institute in Oslo in 1959, the world's first academic research center focused on peace studies, as well as the influential Journal of Peace Research in 1964. He has helped found dozens of other peace centers around the world, and is currently the president of the Galton Institute for Peace Theory and Peace Practice. He has served as a professor for peace studies at universities all over the world, including in Colombia, Oslo, Berlin, Belgrade, Paris, Santiago, Uchil, Buenos Aires, and so many others. He has taught thousands of individuals and motivated them to dedicate their lives to the promotion of peace and the satisfaction of basic human needs. Besides being a theorist, a reference theorist, Johan Galton is also a reference and well-known practitioner. He has mediated in over 150 conflicts between states, nations, religions, civilizations, communities and persons since 1957. His contributions to peace theory and practice include conceptualizing of peace building, conflict mediation, reconciliation, nonviolence, theory of structural violence, and also theorizing about negative versus positive peace, among others. Johan Galton's unique imprint on the study of conflict and peace stems from a combination of systematic scientific inquiry and the Gandhian ethics of peaceful means and harmony. He is also the founder in 2000 and rector of the Transcend Peace University, the world's first online peace studies university, as well as the director of Transcend International, a global non-profit network for peace, development, and the environment, founded in 1993 with over five 500 members in more than 70 countries around the world. You can also find some information on the Transcend Network um, in the um, documents that have been circulated. And made available. As a testimony to this legacy, peace studies are not taught and researched at over 500 universities across the globe, and some are contributing to the peacemaking efforts in conflicts around the world without buying into the securitization sellout. I'm very glad to say, in honor also to say, in the name of our department, that we also at the University of Coimbra have been involved in teaching peace studies uh, at various levels of study, post uh, uh, graduation, postgraduate studies, masters, and doctorate degrees. So it is my absolute honor and privilege uh, to be able to uh, give the floor to Professor Johan Galtung um, and thank him, of course, for uh, being available uh, to share with us his immense knowledge and experience and work. Thank you very much. Just have to press the right button. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. I have a shorter introduction on myself. I have been uh, working on 
more than 150 conflicts. And they have spread themselves over more than 150 countries. And I have written more than 150 books. But I'm not 150 years old. <laughs> Tomorrow, I'll be 87. So, goodbye 86, it was nice to see you. Welcome 87, I look forward to you. I don't walk very well, but I'm in good shape mentally. And it's a pleasure to share these two hours with you. So let's get started. And let me start by trying to maybe talk about some misunderstandings of the road to peace. Disarmament is not the road to peace. You can have as many arms as you want. The question is whether you want them to be used or not. Norway and Sweden have enough arms to destroy each other completely. No problem with that. But they're not targeting on each other. So the point is not disarmament, but dis-targeting, if you will. The legal approach is not a solid road to peace. Because it depends on what kind of law. And the legal approach we have seen so far has a tendency to focus on when war is permitted. And the legal approach is negative. It tries to rule out war. And it says it's only permitted in case of defense and can also be collective defense. So that's Article 50 and 51 in the United Nations Charter. But the legal approach hasn't told us what to do. They only tell us what not to do. It's a negative approach. And that brings me, of course, immediately into the basic distinction we make in peace studies between negative peace and positive peace. Now, negative peace is the absence of violence. Positive peace is building good relations. So negative peace in a couple, in a marriage, is to stop beating and stop quarreling. Positive peace is to start loving. It's not the same thing. As a matter of fact, one could argue that starting loving may be a good way of stopping quarreling and beating. In other words, we are not saying that negative peace comes first and positive peace comes afterward. We would like to see them come together. And my example of a marriage brings up that we in peace studies work at four levels, micro, between and within persons, meso, between and within societies, between groups, for instance, genders, generations, classes, races, nations, provinces, macro, between states, between nations, between nations and states, and mega, between regions, Super states quite often, and civilizations. Micro, meso, macro, mega. But Galton, how can you do that? Micro is psychology, meso is sociology. Macro is political science, and you have economics all over the place. <coughs> And mega, we haven't quite gotten started yet, but it is some kind of political science, international relations. Yes, we do all of that. And we are very much making use of history. Very much. We see 1460 as a very basic year in the Iberian Peninsula. With Felipe II, having a choice between quelling a mutiny in something called Portugal, a kind of province to the west. And west, if you will, southwest. 
<coughs> and something called Catalonia promised to the northeast. He had army, sufficient army for one of them. He chose Catalonia and you became a free country. Catalonia is today exposed to Madrid. And in Catalonia, they spell Madrid in a very interesting way. Mad hyphen R-I-D. <laughs> Starting with mad, saying it's not by chance that they have that name. We'll come back to that because my Japanese wife, Miko Nishimura, who is sitting there, and myself, Johan Galtung, we are living in Spain between Benidorm and Altea, which is between Alicante and Valencia on the Mediterranean coast. We love it. And we suffer, of course, very much. The stupid way they are not able so far to handle Catalonia. But I'll come back to it. It will end okay, but it'll take some time. It'll end okay. Now, I mentioned negative peace and positive peace. But then there are two types of violence. It was mentioned in the introduction, between direct and structural. So direct is by an actor. Could be an individual or a collectivity. And of course, one famous collectivity is a state. Could be that. Could be a region. Could be the West against Islam, Islam against the West. Could be many things. It's intended, it's direct. There is somebody sending the violence and somebody receiving it. It's a sender and a receiver. But then you have structural violence. There is no actor. It is just a structure being violent. And the structure of capitalism kills more people on a daily basis than is killed by homicide and direct violence. Killing them by distributing the resources upwards and taking them from the levels down. Why do we argue cooperatives so often? Because a cooperative can be down at the bottom level. And they can just consume what they produce. And they can have a sales point, inviting others to come and buy from them. A company is something else. A company has customers, workers, managers, chief executive officer, and the board. And the task of the chief executive officer is to have his manager squeeze the workers so that they can squeeze the customers. And then send the profit from all of that to the board. That's a company. It's from the bottom to the top. The customers can be very common people. In a cooperative, you keep it at the bottom. The companies hate cooperatives. That's where the solution is. We'll have many more of them in, that world, in the years to come. Many, many more. And I want to remind you, since this is 2017, that in March, not November, October, in March 1917, there was a big meeting of something called the Communist Party of Russia. And it had a majority, they were called Bolsheviks. And they made a revolution. Bolshoi means big. And they had a minority, the Mensheviks. Mensche means small in Russian. <coughs> what did the Mensheviks stand for? Cooperatives and local autonomy. <coughs> it was often called anarchy. That didn't mean that they didn't want some kind of order, but it should be local level, type of municipality. And economically, it should be local level, kind of cooperative. But the Bolsheviks won. 
They made the revolution, they took over the state, and made the state economy. Now, that came to an end, as we all know. Didn't end very well. I would like to say something about the reason why it came to an end. It was not because NATO was so strong. The Warsaw Pact was also quite strong. And they had nuclear weapons, and they could destroy each other. It was not because of that. But in the Soviet Union, they had the problem. They had a historical theory, from primitive communism, to slavery, to feudalism, to capitalism, to socialism, to communism. Six stages. So that was what mama and dad communist read for their children when they were in bed that night. And I'm quite sure the children fell asleep very quickly because they had heard it a couple of times too often. Now the problem was that they knew what socialism was. It was state capitalism, essentially. And the state took from the units producing. They had cooperatives, but they had to deliver 50% to the state. The cooperative I'm talking about has products for sale. You can come and buy it. But the state didn't pay for the 50%. They just took it. So that was a different kind of system. Now, I'm mentioning structural violence because we have, of course, capitalism. And we have the state socialism, state capitalism, in the defunct Soviet Union. And their big problem was to find out what is communism. I have been 25 times to the Soviet Union. First time in 1953, at your age, at the age of 22, as member of a student delegation, one of the first Western student delegations, to visit the Soviet Union. And I happened to be there the 8th of March, 1953. And you're a little bit too young to remember what happened the 8th of March, 1953. Stalin died. And where was I that day? I would say by chance, in the little town where he was born. The streets were wet by the tears. People were crying, 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 crying. You cannot imagine what it is to see a whole little town crying. A tears of Moscow. Our father in Moscow is dead. Now, we happen to come from Georgia. So there was an element of nationalism in it. But 8th of March. We have experienced quite a lot in this century. And why did communism die? Why did the Soviet Union go down? Because they were unable to define the future. After socialism, communism. What is communism? And they were asking, and it was told them by the top of the party, communism is on the horizon. What is horizon? And they were told by the radio, horizon is something that goes further and further away the closer you come to it. Not a very comforting answer. I'll tell you one thing. If a society doesn't know its future, it is dead. I know another society which doesn't know its future. It's called the United States of America. <laughs> Portugal knows its future. You have a kind of certainty in this country. Spain, somewhat less, particularly right now. But you have a kind of certainty, which will make you go on the way you have been going on for some time, till you get tired. 
you have still some bottom to lift up a little bit, but by and large you have achieved a welfare state. And you will come to the point where you will start asking, what next? And I'm quite sure that you have many people already asking that question. And you have come to the end of some history and you're opening for some new history. So I'm trying to say, we have direct violence and structural violence. There was a guy who made a little study a couple of weeks ago. How many times is the expression structural violence used on the internet? 1.4 million times. Now, I invented that concept, and I'll tell you how I did it. And to see it suddenly having landed on the web 1.4 million times, I could draw the conclusion it has arrived. And I could say there is a lot of consciousness that violence is not only direct, but also structured. We have to change the structure. But if you then go to structural peace, there is almost nothing. And if you go to the two basic words that I want to leave with you, and I'll say it five times, solution orientation. Number one, solution orientation. Solution orientation. Solution orientation. Solution orientation. You don't learn that at the universities in departments of sociology and political science. <coughs> you learn analysis. You usually become very bad at forecasting. The prognosis made from the departments of social science are usually very badly informed. You should read some Chinese philosophy, Taoism, that will help you a lot. And there is no solution for the intention. Because you have been taught by somebody not to mix values into social science. Well, I'm mixing value all the time. I have a value called peace. And I have told you it comes in a negative version and a positive version. And I have two types of violence called direct and structural. So if I now talk about negative peace, it means trying to solve and get rid of direct violence, and trying to get rid of structural violence. So now, how do we do it? How do we get rid of direct violence? Give you the answer, my answer. And you don't have to accept it. I'm just, my task now is just to communicate and to share with you. As I mentioned, I've been working a couple of years on it. I started in 1951, and I found what I read so bad. As a matter of fact, I didn't find any peace studies at all. I only found war studies. I found it so bad that I decided to start from scratch. And what I then, my research brought me to, since 1951 up to today, so I've been working a little bit on it. And I have revealed to you the number of countries, the number of countries, the number of books. So evidently, I am a good person from a Protestant country. You're a Catholic country, you don't know. You're not born with bad conscience. You're born with the permission to confess and get a good conscience again. <laughs> In Protestantism, we don't have that, you see. You're born with a bad conscience, and may it last for a long time. <laughs> Till you die, you should die with a bad conscience too. Then you're a good Protestant. I don't believe in Christianity, I believe much more in Buddhism, but uh, leaving that aside, the bad conscience I have, so that doesn't work. And you can liberate yourself by working hard. So we Protestants become a little bit more hardworking than you lazy Catholics. That's the point we made. I shouldn't say it so clearly as I say it now, but I say it. I tend to be outspoken. So having said that, how do we do it? I mentioned as problem number one. 
direct violence and we want to diminish it. Answer, look for the underlying unsolved conflict and or the underlying unsolved trauma. There are some people who have the wrong answer. It's in human nature. Bullshit. Nonsense. I'll tell you two things that are in human nature. Eating and sexing. <laughs> I see it all over the place. Can be enjoyed all over the place. I remember having read about a monastery in northern Italy with one section for monks and one section for nuns. But the monastery was some years ago and it sort of dilapidated. And when it was decided to kind of destroy it, they found a tunnel between the two parts <laughs> with a little meeting room in the middle. It's my experience that men and women have a tendency to find each other. It's not a very original finding. And food and people have a tendency also to find each other. And if they don't find each other, you get suffering. So having said that, we are looking for the underlying conflict and the underlying trauma. What's a trauma? It's the traces on the mind of violence in the past. It could be verbal violence. I'll never forget what you said 20 years ago. It could be physical violence. Could be the Second World War. Nazi Germany made the biggest Europe that has ever existed. Portugal was not in it. Spain was not in it. Switzerland was not in it. <coughs> but almost everything else was in it. Except for the British Isles. Now, the British Isles were not able to stop that. But with help from the United States of America, Anglo-America, managed the Western part. But Nazi Germany was not beaten by Anglo-America. It was beaten by the Red Army. It's a little bit tough for the West to understand. Two-thirds of the Nazi army was on the Eastern Front. 27 million Russians were killed. The war ended when the red flag was hoisted in Berlin. Was the Red Army, there was a fighting going on in the West, that's true, but it was a trifle relative to the real struggle. It's very hard for Western people to understand, very tough. And most of them haven't understood it, and we never understand it. Why not? Because they're born with Russiaphobia. They've been taught to be afraid of Russia, even to hate Russia, and to prepare attacking Russia. Now, who told them that? <clears throat> Somebody in the year 395. And now we have to know your history, what happened in 395. I'm sure most of you don't know, because you probably have bad history teaching at high school. <laughs> it was the division of the Roman Empire in the Catholic part and the Orthodox part. <coughs> Catholic means universal, and Orthodox means the correct faith. Not very modest names. <laughs> That division is still with us. And most people, like most of this blessed audience, <coughs> don't know about it. Maybe 1,600 years are about enough. Maybe we could get rid of it. Maybe we could wake up and understand that Russia is just like us. Individualism, individualism, individualism. Competition. They are a little bit less competitive than we are. 
they have more brotherhood and sisterhood than we are. You could say that communism had a little bit more solidarity to build on, but not enough. Bertrand Russell said it brilliantly <coughs> when he visited Lenin in 1921, I think it was. And he said it must be very difficult to build a solidary collectivist economy on the basis of the brothers Karamazov. <laughs> The most famous novel by Dostoevsky. And those brothers, there are three or four of them, depending on how you count, were as different as you can imagine. You find more individualism in Russia than in Western Europe. And more in Western Europe than in the United States. I once heard an American defining individualism in the United States. In the United States, we are all individualists. We all drive in our own car. <laughs> if you all do the same thing, maybe you're not that individualist. Individual ownership, yes. It's not a collective car. They don't like that. They weren't individual cars. But it sounds like a very collectivized individualism to me. We have a little bit more diversity in the West. But many parts of the West are trying to Americanize to do their best. And I can be very vicious and I can say one thing. And see, I see in the body shape of some of my beloved Portuguese world citizens that Americanization has had success. The American body shape. You can get rid of it. There are methods. Low carbon. <laughs> well, let's leave that aside. There are other methods, and one can discuss them. Let's leave that aside. I mentioned a lot of things now, and I am now, how do you solve a conflict? Talk with all the parties, one at a time. What do you ask the parties? Now, one at a time. One at a time. What do you ask them? You don't ask them stupid academic questions like what are your values, what are your goals? You ask them, what does the Middle East or West Asia look like where you would like to live? What does the Afghanistan look like where you would like to live? What does the Spain look like where you would like to live? What does the Catalonia look like where you would like to live? You try to get their positive future. And then you ask them, what's the reality today? And they will tell you, it would all have been OK if it hadn't been for those stupid, wicked people. Now, you have one half of humanity that is a little bit more advanced. Instead of black, white, they have shades of gray. And that half is called women. Bless you. <laughs> Shades of gray. But sometimes they could quite good at dark gray and light gray, to put it that way. Not too different from black and white. But women feminists have a very positive future. They hate patriarchy for good reasons. But they are not arguing matriarchy, they are arguing parity. Peace studies have learned a lot from feminism. We use the word parity. We sometimes I prefer the word equity. But it's not quite the same as equality. Because equality you can do by redistribution. You can tax the rich and give to the poor. We prefer interactions that it's made in such a way that both parties get about the same, much, equally much out of it. And that is what women have argued. Sharing the tasks in the house. The positive, wonderful tasks and the not so positive, wonderful tasks. Sharing them. Now, very important. Parity. Equity. 
So you talk with all the parties, but you're not preaching anything. You try to find out what they want. And then you ask them, that is stage number two. Number Stage number one is called mapping. Stage number two is called legitimizing. And stage number three is called bridging. Mapping, legitimizing, bridging. You ask them, how do you justify what you just said? So let us say that they say, we want a Palestinian state, fully recognized not only by Israel, but by the whole world. How do you justify it? We are a nation just like the Jews. We have exactly the same right to a state that they think they have. It happens that we don't have it. We were conquered our territory and partly colonized by them. To what extent we were conquered, to what extent we were colonized, we can quarrel about. But we know perfectly well who lived here and who came later. We also know that they were here 2,000 years ago, but they left and they didn't put up a sign saying we are coming back in 2,000 years. They forgot to put up that sign. But we respect that they have a right to something, so in 1988 we agreed with them. Yes, we recognize Israel. We suffer by doing it. It's giving half a child away. But we can live with it. But we need exactly and we want exactly the same a Palestinian state. Now, that happened in 1988. We still don't have it. We're going to get it. We will get it. It will still take some time. By 2020, at the latest 2050, we have it. You people are young enough to watch it. I am young enough to watch the final decline of the US empire. It should happen before 2020, and it will happen before 2020. So in 2020, when I'm 90, I hope to celebrate with politically liberated Americans the decline and fall of the US empire. I think it has already happened, actually. It's only a small part left. It doesn't, it's not the same as US killing. But who in Washington? Have you noticed what happened to them? They have to kill alone. They have to do their own killing. They don't any longer have imperial elites to do it for them. Pretty <coughs> little things. They do kill, and somebody is promising it will be more than evident. Well, we'll see what happens about that. Now, mapping who are the parties, what do they want? Legitimizing, how do they justify it? We have exactly the same right to the state as the Israelis do, and we are willing to concede, although we suffer, that the Jews have a right to a state. But we demand of them that they acknowledge our right. Not unreasonable. Call the two-state solution. I'm of the opinion that that two-state solution has to be inside the six-state solution, namely Israel, with all the border countries in the kind of West Asian community that brings in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, a recognized Palestine, and of course Egypt. I'm of the opinion that that six state has to be inside a 20 state community. An organization of security and cooperation in West Asia. The six state community can learn from the European community, and the 20 state community can learn from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. So, when I take my peace studies and put it into peace practice, 
I try to do it on a solid ground on what has worked in the past. Things have worked in the past. And things have not worked. You have to know about it. So then comes the third stage. Bridging. You have an idea now. How do you do it? Well, a guy like me, I'm just the founder of an NGO, a non-governmental organization. I don't have political powers. I don't have economic powers. I don't have military powers. But I do have some cultural powers. I can put the value of peace into concrete shape as, what do I call it? I call it the vision. A vision. So of course I have a vision for West Asia, and I mentioned it. Two-state solution inside a six-state solution inside a 20-state solution. And then I have vision number two. Most of West Asia is, is Muslim. Israel is a small speck of land, as they point out very often. So for that reason, they have a tendency to expand into East Jerusalem and the West Bank, where they have nothing to do, but they expand. And Netanyahu has a vision of Genesis 1518, the first book of Moses. And since you have all been raised in a Catholic country, you know your Bible by heart. <laughs> so you know that that is where Yahweh calls on Abraham, telling him that you are my chosen people with a promised land from the Nile to Euphrates, which is Netanyahu territory. He won't get it. Goes through nine countries, nine states by today's man. He won't get it. But what he could get is the following. He could tell his Jewish friends, Islam is based on Judaism and Christianity and Prophet Muhammad. And the first prophet is called Musa, which is Arabic for Moses. And the second process is called Isa, which is Arabic for Jesus. You can live in Islam in Muslim territory. You have the right to do it. Being a part of the Kitab, the book, the Torah, the Old Testament, the Quran, that the three religions have in common. Being a part of that. But there is one thing you cannot do. You can live there, but you cannot draw a circle around yourself and say, this is my property. Forget about that. But you can practice your Judaism as much as you want. And you can have a little community and ask for the permission to have it, where you put up a synagogue or two. You can do that. You will be responsible to the Muslim community, which is called the Ummah, U-M-M-A-H. And it goes from Casablanca in Morocco to the southern part of the Philippines. Now, Casablanca in Morocco to the southern part of the Philippines, the Umma. They don't believe in states. What do they believe in? Well, they have thousands in that area of Imam. And the Imam is the one who is singing from the minaret and calling to prayer. He sings in Arabic and he hardly understands it himself. It doesn't matter. There has been quite a lot of Latin spoken in Catholic countries without people understanding it. It's okay. Makes it a little bit more divine if you don't understand it. It's a part of the trick. But at the same time, he has another foot in the Sharia, which is the court. A very powerful person with a very small district, but very powerful. If you want to impress that part of the world, 
you know, to impress the imams. And I can tell you who have managed to do it and who do it. Without the foreign ministry in Lisboa, no. Because I think the foreign ministry in Lisboa is essentially the local department of Washington State Department. I'm not quite, I haven't seen an independent Portuguese foreign ministry or foreign policy, but I haven't seen much of it. Same applies to Spain, same applies to Norway. And the uh, American ambassador has a backdoor entrance to the foreign ministry to tell them what to do. It's a very famous story. It's called the fifth power of the state. The fourth are supposed to be the media. The fifth is the real one, the American ambassador. And I would imagine you have some similar arrangement in this world. I would imagine. Now, we leave that aside. We just say the following. The vision is an image of what could be. So I have given an image for the Middle East. Now, there is a condition. The image has to take into account all the parties. You talk with the parties, and I can share with you my finding. I haven't found in the world a single party who doesn't have at least one good, reasonable party. Mm -hmm. But Galtung Hitler, well, if I had been sitting next to him in 1924 and asked him, Mr. Hitler, what does the Europe look like where you would like to live? Without the Warsaw, without the uh, treaty, the Versailles Treaty. Could you be so kind and spell it out? The responsible Germans for the war, and they're not saying they were not responsible. The emperor and the aristocracy, and they're punishing the people. He was mad. <laughs> the Versailles Treaty was madness, total madness. If they had changed the Versailles Treaty in 1924, which some people asked them to do, Hitler would not have come to power, and there would have been no Second World War. So, Professor Galtung, somebody said in London, are you saying that we are the guilty ones and not the Nazis? No, sir, Professor, I'm not saying that. I'm saying you shared a part of the guilt. He didn't like that answer either, <laughs> because he had a very clear idea about who were the guilty and who was not. And he was not the only innocent, but the savior of the world. Well, I don't see it that way. So we understand what we do when we mediate, is that we try to find valid points on all sides, and then bringing the valid points together. When we have a broken marriage, I try to find what he is good at and what she is good at. So if we have a marriage in northern Germany, the story has nothing to do with Germany, but anyhow, I just mentioned it. And she has become a Buddhist, a very believing Buddhist. And she looks at her husband, the bicycle dealer, who is a very good businessman. But he has what might be called a little bit bad habit. He brings the accounting books back over to the dining table. And he's sitting there doing his accounting. And he happens to have two pens, not only one with black ink, but another one with red ink. And he uses more than black ink because he's a good businessman. You're only thinking of money, the Buddhist wife says. It's the inner wealth that counts. Ha. Huh. When I look at, no, I cannot look at you, because what you have in your ears and what you have around you, I'm trying to find something. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't, and you're not a good place for me. But I'm sure there are some other women who have something in the air. Or something like that. This is, when I look at that, you seem to be enjoying that wealth quite well. I can live without it. 
Uh, okay, okay, you have a good quality of it. The point that I then did was to talk with each of them one at a time. Because I don't want them to act out their quality in front of me. And what's more important, one at a time so that they can propose some solutions without the other one saying, that's not what you said yesterday, and things of that kind. So, one at a time. And um, I'm sitting there. She's a believing Buddhist. He's a good businessman. My task is to come up with a vision. And my vision was, how would it be? if you perhaps could imagine thinking in terms of possibly running a Buddhist bookstore to get it. A Buddhist bookstore. Buddhism for her bookstore. That bookstore still exists. Their marriage was healed. They were jumping in the air. They were embracing me. And they said, but it's so obvious. Almost all my proposals are obvious. They were only not obvious five seconds ago. And it's still <laughs> Somebody has to say it. Why didn't we find it? And I said, I think I can give you two reasons. Point one, you were too busy quarreling. And that's not a good atmosphere for constructive solutions. And nor is it a good atmosphere inside you. And point two, in the German culture, you don't find conflict solution. You find who is right and who is wrong. And that is called Recht. And Recht stands for law, and it stands for being right. In other words, you have been intoxicated and brainwashed by legal thinking. And legal thinking is useful up to a point, but it's not good for the constructive point. So that's how we go about it. How do we go about trauma? More complicated, I'll cut it short. The most stupid thing you can do is to say, why don't you shake hands? Why don't you apologize? And why don't you say, I'm so sorry? And why don't you say, I forgive you? If you're stupid, do that. <laughs> if you're born stupid, do it your whole life. So what should you do? Ask them to go back to what happened, to the traumatic event. One at a time. Ask them to write down and there is a good English word for it now, your narrative, your story. <laughs> so the conciliator is sitting with two narratives, and then he asks for the permission. Would you permit me to show your narrative to the other? Or could I give the essential points? Because I'm shuttling between the two of you. <laughs> The two hate each other so much that you cannot have them in the same room. Okay? So that's the way he looks at it. This is sheer nonsense. Would you be so kind and write your objections? I asked that to both of them. And I can tell you what happens. The negatives come closer and closer. I step the way he looks at it. I don't like it, but I can understand it. So, the convergence of the negatives. But then you give them a little task. Okay. You had violence because you had a conflict you didn't solve. How could you have solved it? Go back to the past again. And to do that, you have to teach them a little bit. You have to teach them to try to understand the positive future both of you had in mind. And oh, the other one was in the way. And here you come up 
with a major difficulty, and I'm quite sure you have that difficulty in your mind, the definition of conflict. Please don't confuse that concept with violence. C-O-N-F-L-I-C-T, V-I-O-L-E-N-C-E, are spelled differently because they are two different concepts. Violence is doing harm to somebody else, including yourself. Up to suicide. Conflict is incompatible goals. Conflict is incompatibility. You want something and I want something. But it's incompatible goals. It doesn't mean that you and I are incompatible. Let's have a look at those goals. And one way of looking at it, very well known, is a very bad, lazy way. Each of them cut their goal in half and go for the compromise. That's the way of the lazy, of the unintelligent. No, you should be much more ambitious. Not compromise, but both and. I accept your goal, I accept your goal. How can we get both of them? By changing reality a little bit. How can we four types of Swiss people talking four different languages and having two different versions of Christianity? How can we live in the same state? <clears throat> By having one part each. Here we talk German, here you talk French, here you talk reto romanish here you talk Italian. Here you are Protestant, here you are Catholic. Well, they started that in year 1294, more than 700 years ago. And during that period, they also understand we have to be neutral. Because if we have three of the nationalities that are surrounding us, German-speaking, Italian-speaking, French-speaking, inside our country, and we go for one of them, if they have a war, we'll destroy our own country. So they became a federation and a neutral federation. <laughs> How do you solve Ukraine? Very simple. Two nations in one state. Federation with two nations and neutral. Neutrality. It will end up that way. How do you solve Catalonia? Not by shouting, independencia. Constitution. That's not called a debate, that's called shock. <coughs> you solve it by asking <coughs> people, what is the future Catalonia you would like to see and the future Spain you would like to see? So you may get 37% or 38% saying independence. It's a very big Minority. It's a minority. In 2012, it was 37 percent. This year, 38 percent. It's a minority that doesn't even increase. What do the others want? Well, they want nothing. Some of them want rule from Madrid. They are not Catalans, they are Castilians. Or they simply want an autonomous province. Now, how do you negotiate between an autonomous province and independence? I a high level of autonomy. I have played a role, not now, but in the 1990s. Not now, I think I will play a role, being sort of invited to it. The role I played a couple of decades ago I was invited by Pujol, the leader of the time. And he invited me to give a talk about the foreign policy of a sub-state. 
No, he was a very, very bright guy. I think when it comes to brightness and being a good politician, maybe a couple of notches about Carlos Puigdemont, maybe. But that's uh, okay. We don't have it's not a question of leadership; it's a question of ideas. And um, I had a suggestion in a long talk, and I said you could have your own consulates <coughs> abroad. So that if a Catalan dies abroad, he has a right that the necessary service, the repatriation of the coffin and so on, is done in Catalan. You can have your consulates. Catalonia got the consulates. I'm not saying they got it because I said it, but they played a role. And the role of a person like me is somewhere between 1% and 99 it's not zero, it's not 100. I will bargain for around 16, maybe 16.5 or something. So what is the secret? Solution orientation. Solution orientation. Optimism. Optimism. Tell them about solutions. Tell them about solutions. Don't just only talk about problems. <coughs> If you are an academic, you are better at problems than solutions, mm -hmm. I can guarantee you. Try to get out of that. So having said that, I have said most of what I want to say, but I would like to just say one word about how do you reduce structural violence? Horizontalization. Horizontalization. What does that mean? Well, I can give you the Nordic countries as an example. I don't think you are very good in Nordic history, nor is there any reason for you to be. Denmark colonized Norway and Iceland. Sweden colonized Finland. Denmark and Sweden were fighting for hundreds of years. Norway, in a short period, colonized Iceland. It was a normal part of the world. <coughs> It was domination, colonization, and fighting. How did we get out of it? What happened? Well, we got many people in our countries that were specialized on fighting, and they were mercenaries abroad. But above all, they were fighting Sweden, from something called Denmark, Norway. They were fighting Sweden. And one of them was my great, 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 great father, who was an admiral in the Danish Norwegian Navy, fighting Sweden, being beaten by Sweden, so we had to row his own boat into a part of Denmark. It was a bit sort of humiliating for the old guy. So I come from a very bad family, which has a Viking background. It is a lower nobility Viking family. Couldn't be words, I have much to atone for, much to confess. And this is one root of my peace practices, to try to do good again. Now, the way we do it is to encourage horizontal relations. Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, and Finland, and Iceland said, what do you have that we don't have? Not only commercial things, but what is the skill that you don't have that we don't have? And we exchanged not only commercial goods, <coughs> but skills with each other. And Norway was better at equity. But the root of it was isolated small farms. Sweden was better at foreign policy. But the root of it was an arrogant feudal upper class that didn't want anybody on top. Norwegians didn't have that, so we were always searching for somebody to run us. Two different mentalities. Well, we are trying to learn from each other, and out of it came the Nordic Union of five equal countries in a horizontal relationship. Today, you may take that for granted. 
look at the 800 years history before that. We have the European Union with quite a lot of equal equality. Quite a lot. Could be more. Look at 800 years of history. It was not like that. The most successful one I have not mentioned, to my mind, it's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. The 10 states in Southeast Asia. One way of knowing that it is so successful <coughs> is that the media never mentioned them. The media feed on catastrophes, on violence, on failures. That's what they love. An average journalist cannot live without it. Try to feed them successes. They don't even understand it. So something has to be done about the media. At that point, I mentioned some examples of how to get rid of structural violence. And I have mentioned how to build peace. You identify the good in the parties, and you build the project along that. Thank you. I hope I haven't overfed you, but I am now very much open to 25 minutes of Q&A. Thank you. Okay, we, we now have uh, some time for debate, and I'm sure that this wonderful talk which led us from the various stages and concepts of peace research and peace studies has uh, stimulated your thinking about these issues. Uh, so we will take uh, one question at a time. So please raise your hand, briefly introduce yourselves, and be very brief, please. Okay, so we have a one. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much for this amazing uh, talk. Uh, obviously, we're all really uh, overwhelmed by your presence in Coimbra, so thank you very much for coming. Um, I've been wondering uh, why, you, for everything I read from you and why you're talking, uh, it seems to me, and it is for my work at least, that the role of identities is really key uh, when we talk about trauma and narrative and dealing with conflict. And uh, I was just wondering, I, I felt it was really, um, I don't know, uh, I missed the word identity. Uh, I wonder. What can you tell me about this? Why don't you uh, engage more with the, the idea and the concept of identity when you talk about narrative and trauma and uh, mediation and everything? Can you get that to me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You talked about nationalism, which is a collective identity, and you can talk about individual identity. Yes, it enters. And my experience is that when you ask them questions like, what is the kind of person you would like to be in three years? You get much of that. But also when you ask them, what is the Afghanistan you would like to see? What's the Middle East you would like to see? What's the marriage you would like to be a part of? And, uh, an other word for identity is personality. It is the script inside them defining what they think they are. And the psychologist, of course, the psychoanalyst, has as a basic task to try to identify that hidden script. Don't necessarily think of identity as something positive. It's a mix of the positive and the negative. And like all hidden scripts, bring it out in the open and see if it could be changed. Daniela, I'm sorry. Uh, my question was more like, uh, why did you uh, Uh, then, you know, my question was more like, uh, why he doesn't engage with the concept of identity uh, if he doesn't find it useful or uh, not necessary? Or uh, it was more this question. I'm sorry. Just a clarification. Why don't you engage more? It's there all the time. I just define it differently. You see, I define it as the deep script. 
It's all the time I want to have a different word for it. You're called identity, I call it personality. And uh, the point about it is that the person may not him or herself be aware of it. The awareness is often called values and goals, and they're always very beautiful. It's a kind of parade of big words, usually. I'm much more interested in the hidden script, as I mentioned. You see, I can give you an example from myself, and um, it's a very innocent example. Uh, I have been working quite a lot, and I have a tendency to be quite quick, and I talk quickly. And I remember walking on the main street of Oslo. I was so irritated by all these people who walk so slowly. And it suddenly struck me, it could be that's because I walk too quickly. Could be, you see, and that this is a street where you are strolling and the people are of your opinion. That not only do they have a right to walk slowly, but the duty to walk slowly, to be strong. So, it got kind of awake, in a sense. So sometimes you get aware of things about yourself in some kind of collision with other people. I just mentioned it. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, amazing lecture. Uh, I was trying to apply your concepts of positive and negative peace to my to my PhD uh, subject, which is the role of transitional uh, justice. And one of the many existential <coughs> doubts I have while while reading all the theory is that um, at first the the idea of this the transitional um, a justice can be very um, appealing and very positive, but at the same time, uh, in the field, you don't see many uh, positive outcomes because many people feel excluded or many people feel like their narratives are not uh, taken into account. So I, I would like to ask you what's your opinion on the measures that have been taken in the past for traditional justice and, and how can we uh, improve the, the, the notion by, by giving it a more inclusive uh, scope. No, Well, I don't use the word justice, and I'll tell you why. I think there are four definitions of justice, and people use it without telling which one. There is first the definition, the, de the difference between legal justice and social justice. And there are two types of legal justice, punitive and restorative. I could say that punitive justice is violence. And you can do it by cutting off a hand, and you can do it by cutting away some years of freedom, or cutting away some money and call it a fine. Restorative justice raises the question, restoring to what? But of course I find that, in a sense, more compatible. But if it is restoring to the past, maybe the past was not good enough. Maybe it was, maybe there was something wrong about the past. And maybe we people who are talking about negative peace and positive peace, would like to see into less violence and more positive peace. In other words, the word restorative may be too individualistic. And it may actually mean making the person obedient 
disciplining the person. So then restorative justice and punitive justice, very different. And we have two social meanings, distributive and equitative. Distributive justice is to take from the rich and give to the people. And that's what we have been doing with progressive taxation. In Norway, the Norway I grew up in, we take from the top third, we give them back things, but they get less than we take from them. We give things to the bottom third, we also tax them, but we tax them less than we give them. And the middle third get about as much back as they pay. It was not a bad society, it was a welfare state. I have seen poor states in my, in my land. But equity, you see, is something else. This is distributive justice, equity justice. Equity is that each act of parties interacting is done in such a way that they get equally much out of it. Jouen Lai and Jawaharlal Nehru, two giants. Two giants. Let us say that one was yellow and one was brown. Gandhi was brown. Mandela is black. It's black. These giants have a tendency not to be white, which is interesting. Now, Jawaharlal Nehru and Zhu Enlai, in connection with the Bandung Conference in 1954, came up with a definition of cooperation. And I wish our leaders knew that definition. For mutual and equal benefit. The two words, and equal. So they were sitting on top of two giant countries, the two most populous countries in the world, India and China, of course, even more populous. Quite big in the area too, neighbors to some extent. And they wanted cooperation for mutual and equal benefit. Imagine that you started in <coughs> kindergarten just with that little expression, mutual and equal benefit. And that the kindergarten teacher knew something about how to practice it. It would come much, much further. So I remember the kindergarten we were mediating. We were mediating down to the age of two. Below two is difficult because they cannot talk. <laughs> They can walk, but they cannot talk. And I'm afraid to say that our methods are a little bit verbal. <laughs> there are many words in it. So down to the age of two, of course, we can do it. So we have two two years old fighting about the teddy bear. It's mine! It's mine! So they're shouting like Japan and China fighting about an island. It's mine! It's mine! So the question now is, what does the kindergarten teacher do? So, you see, the point about it, she can say in this kindergarten, we don't fight, we don't shout. Besides, the teddy bear is neither yours nor yours, it belongs to the kindergarten. And we say to the kindergarten teacher, that's not good enough. That's negative peace. You have to go one step further to positive peace. And what do you mean by that? And in the kindergarten teacher academy, nobody had told them that. <laughs> So we said, well, maybe you could suggest that um, you could put the teddy bear at the center of the table, and you could dance around it. <laughs> Quite sure the teddy bear would enjoy it. <laughs> In other words, the teddy bear is the centerpiece, and you participate, you share in a collective adoration of the teddy bear. <laughs> you could also try to sing in the honor of the teddy bear. The teddy bear will enjoy it. So I hope that this will be 
taught next year in the Kindergarten Teacher Academy. In other words, positive peace in dealing with teddy bears. <laughs> but as you understand, something you do to get it, and you make the object of contention an object of mutual adoration. Okay, sorry for long answers, but it's because you ask some important questions. It's your fault. <laughs> Good morning, Professor. My name is Maria. I'm from Novago School from Lisbon. I did a long trip to come here to see you. <laughs> from Lisbon. Uh, well, I'm from the legal background, so I'll do a tricky question for you because uh, I just noticed that legal background is not well seen by, by your peace studies. But, well, uh, I also study transitional justice, as my colleague does. Uh, and my question is, uh, transitional justice has goals of guarantees of non-repetition. And guarantees of non-repetition are, are also part of a, a peace-building project. <coughs> so we, uh, through the retrib retributive mechanisms of transitional justice, you don't believe in guarantees of non-repetition? I didn't say that I would eliminate punitive justice and restorative justice and distributive justice. I didn't say that. I think we need some of it, but we should have much less. And what I'm in favor of is equitable, equitative, is actually the English word for it, justice. You organize society in such a way that there is a give and take with mutual and equal benefit. Now let me give an example. Let me give an example from Norway and Sweden. After the war, Norway had been run down by German occupation. Sweden had um, benefited from the neutrality. Sweden had a much wiser leadership than we had. I am not denying it was feudal, upper class, aristocratic, arrogant, all of that, but with a lot of wisdom. Norway was almost never independent, Sweden was never dependent. It's a difference. So you look at the world differently. We come out of the world, and one way in which we could now relate to Sweden was by selling fish and importing Volvo cars. <laughs> Which would be the classical way in the world called European colonialism. It's what Portugal did in Mozambique and Angola. <coughs> it's what Spain did in what became Latin America, and so on and so on, England and France. You import resources, you process it themselves, you sell it back with the value added in your pocket. And most of that value added is the experience, the science, and technology that you develop to do it. The Swedes decided we will not deal with Norway that way. Yes, we have all the cars. But we will do something since we came out of the war rich and they came out of the war poor. We will stimulate and invest in a tool in Norway. And then we will exchange tools with cars, not fish with cars. In other words, we will do things at the same level of processing. Economists will recognize what I have said as intrasector, not intersector trade. The point is the level of processing and the externalities, the positive externalities that go with them. And if you want to build equity, it has to be at the same level. Now, 
There was a very particular Swede who was behind this, Gunnar Myrdal, a genius, married to a woman, a lady, Alva Myrdal, also some kind of genius. So we benefited from the wisdom of that couple, who incidentally I knew very well. And uh, very grateful. And Norway was lifted up. Now we have been lifted up by oil. But oil is still a resource. And the poor Swedes don't have oil. So the Swedes have a joke. Do you know why Norwegians have so greasy hair? It's because the oil has gone to the head. <laughs> and uh, so, so we have all of that going on. We have jokes and everything. But Norway has not been generous. Norway has enjoyed being the underdog country coming up. I'm arguing against it. I'm going so far as to say, why don't you lease to Sweden a sector of the Norwegian oil sector? Why don't you do that? Why don't you remember what Sweden did to us in 1945? Be good to them. Well, it hasn't happened. I have also argued that much better than to get up all that oil would be to let it stay where it is. It's not a question of it belonging to Norway, it belongs to nature. Let it stay, it will only do damage. I haven't had much success with that either, but that is coming now, that's coming. So, having said that, we have all these problems, you see, all of them, and we somehow have to come to grips with it. And it brings in various types of justice. So what I would like to see that's the final answer. Move from punitive to restorative, from restorative to distributive, from distributive to equitative. To do that, you have to be familiar with all four concepts, not only the legal ones. Professor, thank you for your, your lecture. I'm Natalia, I'm Colombian and I would like to ask a question about the Colombian uh, concept. Uh, I'm going to read it. Um, you've said to a domestic newspaper in Colombia that unless Colombia solves its structural forms of violence translated in misery, then the peace agreement, the treaty we've just signed, uh, with, uh, is only pacification. But most of our domestic problems cannot be solved locally because they have a lot to do with the economic and political uh, issues that Colombia is embedded in. So it's kind of a local solution for a global problem, and I would like to hear some of your insights about it. that you are here, and I'm very happy you asked the question. Thank you. I have been about 20 times to your country. There was once a meeting in the Senate, El Senado. First speaker, the president of the Senate, la presidenta. Second speaker, the president of the country, Mr. Uribe. Third speaker, me. And I said, Mr. Oliva, I congratulate you on your plan for economic development for 40% of the Colombian population. Very good plan for the upper 40%. I happen to be more interested in the bottom 20%. <coughs> and I didn't hear a word about what you're going to do about that. Now, that structural violence and that structural violence has a racial connotation. The bottom 20% are to a large extent indigenous and black. The country was indigenous 
when the Spanish came, they are now down to 3.4%. The blacks are higher than that, they are about 10, 12 percent. But when you go to the poorest region, we are essentially down to black and indigenous. So you want peace. And you have to horizontalize. You have to lift the bottom up. You do not lift the bottom up by the two words, land reform. Because even if you distribute land better, you need more than land to grow food. You need water, you need manure, you need seeds. Maybe you need some tools. They don't have any of that. You cannot just say distribute land. If you do that, it will benefit those who get the land, who are rich, and can buy those other things. But we're not dealing with that kind of situation. We're dealing with a large part of the Colombian population in Misery. How do you solve that? Well, you solve it by permaculture, by labor-intensive way of cultivating the land. And since you now have a peace agreement, which you confuse with peace, between FARC and the government represented by Mr. Santos, you have an armistice, not peace, a ceasefire, not peace. But you should remember that FARC Fuerzas Armadas, Revolucionarias, you should remember that they have been there in Colombia because you had a basic problem. And the problem was the misery, the structural violence I'm talking about. So I suggest that you make teams, three former FARC militants and three soldiers. Teams of six. You give them a course in permaculture. And you teach them La Pistoleta Argentina. And you have to know what the Pistoleta Argentina is about. It's a pistol that shoots seeds. And you put it 30 centimeter down, and you plant a seed. Tap, 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 tap. For heaven's sake, don't plow long fields and plant the same seed all the time. It's the worst thing you can do. The Pistoleta Argentina. Then you have to have some water. And you should know where you have planted the seed, and you have a tube. And that tube has some small holes, drip water irrigation, and it drips water into all those holes and you will get almost immediate result because the soil is excellent. It will sprout up immediately. It's very labor intensive, but you have the labor. That's the only thing you have. So use that one, give them the pistolet to Argentina, and teach them how to do this. <coughs> and work in teams and train the teams. So, I've been to your country very often. First time in 1962 when you did not exist. I apologize for that, but that is the point about it. It was in the period called La Violencia. It was very violent. And I was talking, I was trying to understand it. And the point about it is they were killing, 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 but in good Catholic tradition, they went and confessed afterwards to the priest. <laughs> so I was talking with the priest. And I asked him, when they confess, what do you say? And he said, well, excuse me for saying this in Spanish, pero por lo menos no aprovechaste. You didn't enjoy it. No, of course I didn't enjoy it. We just had to get rid of them. I didn't enjoy it. 
it was very clear he had enjoyed it utterly, but anyhow, he, he, he tried to say that. Now, that's not the way of solving a problem. Oh, please. What the priest said was not the way of solving it. Identify <coughs> the underlying conflict, and I have tried to indicate some ways of lifting the bottom up. And I tried to indicate that to do it by teams, from the old FARC and from the soldiers. But I would like to draw the attention to the fact that it was what he associated with the name Santos. And he very wrongly, by a stupid Norwegian committee called the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, they were very good this year, though, I have to admit. He got very wrong the Nobel Peace Prize for a ceasefire, which is not peace. Okay, I'm sitting in La Presidencia together with the young boys who are doing this work, you see. And let me only say we have a very good dialogue about the details. Yes, absolutely. You are not the problem, I am the problem. <laughs> Please. I'm pretty glad. Ah, okay. Hello. Uh, I actually write about uh, solution oriented. Oh, I write about solution. It's a man talking? Yeah. Sorry about that. Hey, <laughs> right. uh, uh, I write about solution oriented thinking, and uh, I was curious on the rare occasion that people actually do follow that pattern. How do you move out of it once you've picked a solution that's not working? Because people and governments and uh, organizations get very committed to their ideas, and their reputations and egos get attached to it. So when things don't go right, how do you deal with uh, the sort of secondary consequences of picking a solution and executing it? Exactly the same way as I have said. You talk with the parties one at a time, what do you want? And generally, what you end up with is high level of autonomy, not sedition, not a new state. But in some cases, maybe a new state for some period. I can take Yugoslavia as an example. There was multilateral sedition, and out of it came six states. They are now seeking to get it. And you see, it's the question of knowing what is between one state and several states, federation and confederation. Confederation is also called community. And at the bottom of the community, you have something called a space. But at least you are coming together for dialogue, even if you are now separate states. The problem you see, and the answer to your question, is that most people don't know that there are so many things in between. They only know one state or independence. Catalans don't know about these things in between, nor does Madrid. So it's a question of sometimes teaching them what is in between. And they heard about it, and the most convincing way of teaching is by means of examples from other places. What I did in Indonesia, for instance, and things like that. Well, I'll try to answer some of your questions. I hope that was sufficient. And I would just like to say some few final words myself. The weak point in what I have told you, to criticize my own method, or our method, transcend. Transcend means to go beyond, to find something new. <coughs> Let me identify two weak points. There is one thing which is difficult to do. 
It's the creative stage. You have a Buddhist lady and a clever bicycle business. No? The jump to a Buddhist bookstore is not automatic. So that's the creativity part. You can train yourself. Don't think you are born creative. I can guarantee you, you are not. You can train yourself. But please don't start with Israel Palestine. <laughs> start with your own problems and try to find that creative transcending both and. Not either or, but both and. So what I pointed out is there is a difficult part, and that's the creativity part. And the second point is a totally different one. Right? <coughs> when people ask me, uh, why don't you aim at position as foreign minister or the high level in the United Nations? And I said, my problem is not like a problem. My problem is I have too much power. I have had an enormous impact through Solution orientation, solution orientation, solution orientation, optimism, optimism, inspiring examples, and things of that kind. It's not like a problem. It could be too much. And for that reason, I want to share it with as many as possible. We spread the conflict solution culture in the world, you see. And I'm hoping that 5% of this audience would be in it. That is usually a good, let us say, result. So I salute the 5% and hope the 95% have had some good memories, nonetheless. Thank <laughs> you. É o dia do comemorando dois aniversários. É as Nações Unidas. What? How many years the UN? You know? Uh -huh. How many years the United Nations tomorrow? Seventy-two. Okay. Seventy-two. Yeah. Ok, então amanhã as Nações Unidas comemoram 72 anos e amanhã o professor Galtung comemora 87. Eles nasceram no mesmo dia. E pronto, isso é um motivo de celebração para nós, que ele vai passar o seu aniversário aqui, conosco, no Porto. E a outra coisa, nós temos um, um, um website, eu e sou editor, é Jornalismo de Paz. Jornalismo para a paz, que é diferente de jornalismo que, é, que corre atrás das bombas, quem está ganhando, quem está perdendo, como se fosse um jogo. E eu, eu, eu convidar a Luzia para uh, subscrever a essa uh, uh, né, Weekly Digest. É em inglês, mas tem em, em várias línguas. E é www.transcend.org. É muito fácil. Transcend.org. Não? É TMS. Se desse para escrever em, em algum lugar para eles poderem saber. Se é, você entrar no site da Transcend, você consegue. Transcend é TMS. Ok, entra lá. É, entra lá, Transcend. Não, mas. Tiroína. Now, just one, one, just one, one, say something. We have some books down there, 20 euro and 10 euro. And if you care to buy them, you get to read my signature. I have the pen ready. Okay, so stay 
Do you see why I didn't use that method? I just talked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so let me just ask you to join me in a final round of applause um, uh, and thank uh, Jan Galtuk for sharing his immense knowledge and uh, experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.